So I want to begin by talking about who is Allah, who is God. So this is obviously a major topic, but once in a while, you know, we turn on the television and we hear somebody say something like, you know, Muslims, they worship Allah, and Allah is the moon god, right? Very, very common type of <laughs> polemic. There's a panel there, and they say, well, what do you mean by that? We'll say, it's very simple. Muslims, they use a lunar calendar, right? Of course, Jews use a lunar calendar. I mean, they practice intercalation. They have a leap month every three or four years, but it's still a lunar calendar. So this type of thing. So uh, instead of, you know, kind of listening to these caricatures, Muslim theologians actually have a working definition of Allah. Obviously, there's no way to define Allah. There's no way to define God. God is infinite, and language and articulation is finite. So it's impossible to be adequate in our... Uh, in our uh, description or definition of God. But for the sake of saying something, I'm going to have to say something, right? So they say that, that Allah is alamun ala that, a proper name denoting the essence. Al wajibul wujud, the one who has necessary existence, the necessary existent. Al mustahiq li jami' al kamalat, the one who is deserving of every type of perfection. And the one who is free or transcendent of every type of deficiency or weakness. Right? So this is who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is. And we say subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning transcendent and exalted is he. You know, it's really interesting because there's been a paradigm shift. In the first three centuries of the Christian era, there was a lot of propaganda spread about uh, the Jews. There was a Christian bishop named Marcion, a Christian scholar, who said things like, you know, the Jews, they worship a different God. They worship a lesser God. The God of the Old Testament is a different God. He called him the Demiurge or Yaldaboath. And Marcionism, uh, it was very popular. I mean, in Rome, it was very popular. It was so popular that Tertullian of Carthage, who was a second century Christian apologist, he actually wrote a five-volume refutation of Marcionism, right? So that type of paradigm has now shifted, where we see elements within Judeo-Christianity now saying the same things about the God of Islam, about Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, that Muslims, they worship a different God, that Muslims have nothing to do with Judeo-Christian morals and ethics, their theology is completely out of whack, this type of thing. So we have to recognize that. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is the God of Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. In Hebrew, it's pronounced Eloh. So there's a verse in Deuteronomy 32.17. So this is the fifth book of the Torah. It's called the Devarim in Hebrew. In which it says, Yizbachu uh, l'shaydim lo Eloh. That describing pagans that they uh, sacrifice to shaydim, shayateen, to demons, and not to Allah or Eloh. In Aramaic, it's pronounced Allah. This is called, according to the BDB, the Brown Driver Briggs uh, Hebrew English Lexicon, which is pretty much the standard uh, at the uh, graduate school level. What's interesting is um, there's a translation of the New Testament into Syriac. Now, Syriac, or also known as Late Aramaic, was the language of the Prophet Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, whom we call Isa, alayhi salam. And so the New Testament originals are in Greek, but in the 4th century, Christian scholars translated the Greek manuscripts back into the language of Jesus, back into the vernacular of Jesus. It's called the Peshitta, and this replaced the Tatian's uh, Diatessaron. And Matthew 5, 9, Jesus is reported to have said, in his own language, Blessed are those who make peace, for they shall be called the children of Allah. And children of God is actually a very common expression in first century Palestine. It does not denote anything literal, right? This is something that's uh, spiritual, like God is our Father in the sense that he loves us, he takes care of us. Jesus in the Lord's Prayer, for example, which is from a Q source document, Matthew and Luke record it. He says, Avunda Vashmayo Nithkatashmoh, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. All of us, right? So this type of thing. Um, so he uses the word Allah for God, according to this fourth century 
uh, Aramaic uh, uh, manuscript. Jesus is recorded in the Quran as saying, "Inna Allah Rabbi wa Rabbukum fa'abudu." Hada siratu mustaqim. It is Allah who is my Lord and your Lord. Worship Him. This is the straight path. You know, it's interesting uh, when we compare the first miracle of Jesus in the Quran and in the New Testament. The first miracle of Jesus recorded in the New Testament is in John chapter 2. So obviously John was the last of the canonical gospels to be written according to the consensus of scholars, so New Testament scholars. But chronologically, right at the outset of Jesus' ministry when he was 30 years old, he performs his first miracle. John chapter 2 records it. He's in uh, a place called Cana. It's a wedding, and they're out of wine. Uh, so his mother comes to him, Mary, and says, we're out of wine. And Jesus responds by saying, Ti emoi kai soi gunai. What is it to me or you, woman? Right? Which is a common expression in uh, Hebrew. Mali walach. What does it have to do with me and you? Right? So then, eventually, he turns these water pots into wine, and people drink the wine. That's his first miracle in the New Testament tradition. The first miracle of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, as recorded in the Quran, uh, is when Mary brings the infant Christ into the sight of her family. <clears throat> and Muslims believe in the virgin birth, by the way. And at this point, Mary is maybe 11 or 12 or 13 years old. According to church tradition, according to documents that are outside the Christian canon, like the Proto-Gospel of James, Mary was 12 years old when she was married to Joseph the Carpenter. According to Greek Orthodox tradition, Mary was 11 years old and Joseph was in his 90s. So he actually had, it's, yeah, it's very strange for us today, um, but that was the culture back then. We have to have sort of a historical consciousness. So he had, he had grandchildren that were actually older than his wife. Um, so she brings the infant Jesus within the side of her family and they begin insinuating things about her, right? So you can imagine... I mean, I don't care how saintly you think your sister is. There's nothing she can say, right, that's going to exonerate her. I heard some voices and I said, no, 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 no. Something happened, right? You did something, right? So the Quran says, فَأَشَّارَتْ إِلَيْهِ That she pointed to the baby. قَالُوا كَيْفَ نُكَلِّمُ مَنْ كَانَ فِي الْمَهْدِ سَبِيَّةِ They say, how can we speak to one who is an infant, a child in the cradle? And by a special miracle, Jesus spoke, his words are recorded in the Quran. Inni Abdullah atani al kitaba wa jaalani nabiya wa jaalani mubarakan aina ma kuntu wa ausani bil salati wa zakati ma dumtu hayya. He says, Indeed, I am a servant of God. He has given me the book and has appointed me as a prophet and has made me blessed wheresoever I am and has joined on me prayer and charity as long as I live. This story is actually told in a chapter in the Quran called Surah Maryam, chapter Mary. There's a chapter in the Quran named after the mother of Jesus Christ. Peace be upon both of them. Right? Chapter 19. Um, and what does the Quran say about Mary? God says in the third chapter of the Quran, verse number 42, قَالَتِ الْمَلَائِكَةُ يَا مَرْيَمُ إِنَّ اللَّهَ اسْتَفَاكِ وَتَهَرَكِ وَاسْتَفَاكِ عَلَى نِسَاءِ الْعَالَمِينَ That, O oh Mary, God has chosen thee and purified thee, chosen thee above the women of all nations. Above all nations, Mary was chosen. In Arabic orthography, which is like spelling conventions, Whenever a patronymic is written, or a matronymic, if the first name is not mentioned, the guttural aleph on the, uh, the, the phrase son of is retained. For example, if I write the name Ibn Abbas in Arabic, I'd write Alif Ba Nun, <clears throat> right? Three letters. But if I mention his first name, Abdullah bin Abbas, the aleph will drop, the guttural aleph will drop. This is true in every single case except when the name of Jesus is mentioned. So Jesus in the Quran is called Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary. And the exegetes say, this is for several reasons, but one of the major reasons is to refute the idea that Jesus Christ, peace be, peace be upon him, is the literal or begotten son of God. The other reason is to emphasize, as it were, the absolute noun Mary, that Jesus, comma, who is the son of Mary, Right? So, uh, Mary is not just great by virtue of her son, 
But Jesus is also great by virtue of his mother, that Mary has an exalted status in the Islamic tradition. In fact, there's a story in the Quran, the story of Zechariah, who was a Kohen. He was a priest in the temple. And he was the caretaker of Mary, according to the Quran. And the Quran says that when every time he would walk into her prayer chamber, he would notice there was food next to her and food that he did not give her. Right? So you'll read things like this as well in uh, the Proto-Gospel of James again, which is outside the Christian canon. It's not of the New Testament. But we have to remember that the canon, at least in the Catholic tradition, was not totally closed until the Council of Trent, which is like in the 15th century. So this was written in the second century. It's mentioned in the Gospel of James, Proto-Gospel. So back to the Quran. So he sees this food next to her. And an exeget named Imam At-Tabari, he says that it was fruit out of season. So he says, Ya Maryam, anna laki hadha. Oh Mary, where did you get this from? قالت هو من عند الله إن الله يرزق ما يشاء وبغير حساب. This is from God. God gives to those who ask without measure. And Zechariah عليه السلام Zechariah was like I said a priest. He's considered to be a prophet according to our tradition, and he was a very old man at the time. So he has the wisdom of age. He has the title of a kohen, and he has the the office of of prophecy. And he was very old, and after a time. You know, he wanted a son, and after a time, he kind of forsook his supplication. He's too old now. God didn't give him a son. But what does the Quran narrative tell us at this point? That as, as soon as he heard those words from Mary, who again is a 12-year-old girl, 13 years old at this time, maybe younger, immediately, Zechariah turns in supplication one more time to God with this renewed sense of certitude that he learned from a 12-year-old girl. This is a priest and prophet, an old man, right? So he prays to God, give me a good son or a good progeny, he says, right? Uh, uh, Verily, you are the one who hears supplications. While he was yet standing in the prayer chamber, the angels call out to him, Anna Allaha yubashiruka bi Yahya. God gives the glad tidings of John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam. So this demonstrates the exalted status of Mary in our tradition. Now going back to the name Allah. So the, the name Allah is very unique. There is no natural gender. So Arabic names, also in Hebrew and in Greek, although in Greek there's the neuter, we don't have that in Arabic and Hebrew. But nouns in Hebrew and in Arabic are, are genderfied. Each have a gender assigned to them. Sometimes it's based on its natural gender, right? Like the word for boy in Arabic is walad. And walad is going to be masculine because a boy is masculine. But the word for girl, bint, a girl is feminine, so it's natural gender. The word is feminine. But the word for the sun, for example, ashams. What is the gender of ashams? <clears throat> Does anyone know? Mu'annath. It's feminine. There's nothing in the word to tell you. There's no outward sign. Right, ta marbuta, aliful mamduda, maksu, nothing like that. There's no outward sign to tell you that this word for sun is feminine. You just have to know it. There's no natural gender. The sun is not f male or female. But lexically, it's female. So when we say the name Allah and we say, who Allah? He is God. We're talking about his lexical gender. God is not a male nor a female. Okay, in our tradition. Right? So. <clears throat> And this name, it cannot be made diminutive. It cannot be made plural or dual. As soon as you say the name, your tongue will prostrate. You say, Allah, Allah, your tongue prostrates. I, so, I see some people practicing right now. <laughs> Even your tongue will prostrate. It's made up of four Arabic letters. When you take off the first letter, the alif, it becomes lillahi, for God. When you take off the next letter, the lam, it becomes lahu. For him. When you take off the next letter, the lamb, it becomes who? Him. Right? It's a very interesting uh, word. So in Hebrew, the, the form Eloh is usually pluralized. Like in the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, you read Adonai Eloheinu or Elohim. Elohim, the im, is a plural. It's a plural of respect. Right? Like it says in Genesis 1 1, Bereshith bara Elohim. 
et hashemayim. In the beginning, literally, gods created the heavens. Right? So this does not denote a plurality of some sort in the Godhead or in the essence of God. That's not how Semitic peoples understand it. This is called a plural of majesty, a royal plural. Like the Queen of England will say, we declare. Right? But the Queen is only one person. However, in the Quran, the word Allah cannot be made plural. It's very unique. But there are pronouns in the Quran referring to Allah that are plural. وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبِلِ الْوَرِيدِ We are closer to man, in the generic sense, than his, again in the generic sense, jugular vein. We are very close to the human being. Right? We. But God is an absolute unity, according to our tradition. So this is called the, the royal plural. And by the way, anytime you see the, uh, the word El in, in, in a name, that's the name of God. It's a theophoric name. Like the name of the prophet Ishmael is pronounced Yishmael in Hebrew. We say Ismail, which is an Arabicized way of saying it. But its origin is Hebrew, Yishmael, right? And unfortunately today we live in an age where if you go to the bookstore, you'll find a lot of polemical literature that's, you know, degrading and denigrating and insulting, you know, Arabs and the Ishmaelites and people that are claiming to have PhDs are saying, Ishmael means this in Hebrew and it's, it's something terrible. Uh, no, I, I don't, maybe they're just, all these people just profligates, right? Just trying to get money and things like that. Allahu alam. But if they've done the research, Ishmael comes from shama, which means to hear, right? Like sami'a in Hebrew, in, in Arabic. So yishma, the yod here is a prefix of the present tense. Yishma, he hears. Who, hell, who hears? Yishmael, God hears. God will hear. This is a theophoric name. It's very exalted. So Muslims will look at that and say that God hears and will, will continue to hear the prayers of Ishmael and his progeny. And of course, the Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, peace and blessings of God be upon him, is from the progeny of Ishmael. He is a direct descendant, just as Jesus is a descendant of Isaac, uh, peace be upon both of them. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a descendant of uh, Ishmael, or like the name Elijah, right? Eliyahu, my God is Yah, my God is Adonai, the Lord, right? Yah is a shortened form of the Tetragrammaton in the Old Testament, which is articulated by some Christians, but there are Jews here, so I'm not going to attempt to articulate it out of respect for the Jews that are here, but they read Adonai instead of articulating the yod he vav he right? That's how I'll read it. So Eliyahu, my God is Adonai, or like Gabriel, right? Gabriel, the name of God, uh, Michael, right? El Roy, L. Ron Hubbard. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> I, I apologize to the, if there's any Scientologists. I couldn't help myself. El Mo. So now hold on to your hats and to your hijabs and your hair pieces when I say this next part is that Muslims believe that Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad, peace be upon all of them, were all Muslims. What do I mean by that? It's a misnomer to say that Muhammad, peace be upon him, founded Islam. We believe that he perfected the religion of Islam. So the word Muslim comes from salama or salam, meaning peace. It's an active participle on the fourth form, a causative form. The one who causes there to be peace. Uh, so the exact cognate in Hebrew is on a verbal stem called hifil. It's mashlim, mashlim. That's how you say Muslim in Hebrew. So if we go back to uh, Matthew 5, 9, right, where Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers. Guve hon le'ovde shlomo. Le'ovde shlomo is not a very good translation. Because in the original Greek, it's one word. It's a participle. Irenopoyas, right? Literally, a maker of peace. But when they translated it into Syriac, they said literally, a maker of peace. It's more of a phrase. But if we translate this, and I've seen a translation into Hebrew, uh, he says, Baruch Hamashlimim. Baruch, blessed, are Hamashlimim, the Muslimin, which is the accusative plural. So, Muslims believe that Jesus actually uses this term. Um, and to demonstrate my point, I hope I don't offend anyone with this, it's good that we can have open and frank discourse. That's part of the beauty of living in America, right? 
So um, if Moses were to walk into this Islamic center, and I had the honor and privilege of speaking to Moses, Moshe, Shalom Alav, Musa alayhi salam, and I said, oh Moses, are you a Jew? Right? He would say, no, I'm a Levite. Why would he say that? Because he never heard the word Jew in his life. He never heard the word Jew uh, except in reference to a descendant of Judah. Right? But Moses is not from Judah. David is from Judah. Moses is from Levi, another son of Jacob. So he would think that I was actually referring to a tribal distinction. But I'm not talking about a tribe. I'm talking about a religion, a faith tradition. But if I asked him further, I said, if I said, are you a practitioner of Judaism? He would have no idea what I was talking about. Because the word Judaism wasn't coined as a faith tradition until 700 before the Common Era, some seven or 800 years after the death of Moses, peace be upon him, when, the, when Palestine was divided into the northern and southern kingdom, and the Assyrians came and wiped out 10 of the 12 tribes, the only two tribes that remained basically were Benjamin and Judah in the south. Judah's the older brother, so they called themselves Al Yahud, the Jews. Right? Now, I would expect Moses to say, that my religion is submission unto God. I submit my entire being unto God. And that's called Islam. Right? Shalom. Islam. If Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, were to walk into this Islamic center, and Muslims believe in the second coming, it's mentioned in our orthodox uh, creedal articulations. So it's, it's very conceivable that he might actually, in the future, come into this Islamic center. And I had the honor and privilege of asking him, Oh, Jesus, are you a Christian? Now, if you believe Jesus have, has omniscience, then he would know what I was talking about. But Muslims don't believe that he's omniscient. So he would say no, because he's never heard of this. The book of Acts tells us that believers in Christ were being expelled from the synagogues. And this was actually uh, used as a derogatory term for the disciples of Jesus, initially. Because the first Christians were Ebionites, Evion, or Nazareans. These were Jews that believed that Jesus was the Messiah, according to history. So I would expect him to say, my religion is a religion of submission unto God. This is what he says. Whoever does the will of God is my mother, my brother, and my sister. Right? So we would say that these prophets taught the same theology and they believed in the same theology. And in a word, that concept in Arabic is called tawheed, which comes from wahid, oneness. Oneness of God, the uniqueness of God, that God is radically transcendent. There's a radical monotheism. The Quran says, Laysa kemithlihi shay'un. There's nothing like the likes of God. There's nothing even close to God. Abu Bakr as Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, who is a disciple of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he said, Al ajazu an idrakihi idraku. He said, Your in inability to comprehend God is your comprehension of God. And Augustine said the same thing. Basically, if you comprehend something, it is not God. Right? <clears throat> but Muslims will take it a step further. Muslims, according to our theology, we assign God certain attributes. There's a, a group of attributes known as uh, as sifatu salbiya, negating attributes. These are things that, uh, that negate anything that could uh, potentially be unbecoming of his greatness and majesty. So one of the negating attributes of God is mukhalifatun lil hawadith, that he is completely and utterly dissimilar to his creation in every way, completely dissimilar. So Muslims will say that this is not a new idea or concept, that this is something that's been taught for thousands of years from the ancient prophets, the ancient Israelite prophets, for example. Uh, so if we look at the Decalogue, right, the Ten Words, the Ten Commandments, which are recorded in Exodus 20 and Deuteronomy 5, the text in Exodus seems to be the more ancient text. It's from the e-source, if you believe in the sources. I mean, that's a different debate. But Exodus chapter 20 begins by saying, Anoki Adonai Elocheka, I am the Lord your God. Asher Hutseitecha Me'eretz Mitzrayim, Mid'beit Avadim. The one who brought you out from Egypt, from the land of bondage, from the house of bondage. And then he says, Lo lacha Elohim acharim al panai. You shall not have any other gods before me. Number three, very important. Lo, he says, Lo ta'ase lacha fesel, vikul tamuna asher, 
You shall not make unto thyself the image or the likeness of anything in the heavens above. The asher ba'aretz mitachat, or the earth below. The asher b'may mitachat la'aretz, or the waters beneath the earth. In other words, God is nothing like His creation. God is nothing like His creation. God is not in His creation. God is not in the temporal world. God is not in the world of matter and substance. God is not matter nor substance. Right? And this is the message also of Deutero-Isaiah. If you're familiar with uh, the Hebrew prophets, I encourage you to read Deutero-Isaiah, uh, which basically says that as soon as we bring God into the temporal world, as soon as we bring him down into the temporal world, we make an idol out of him. That this is a, the actual definition of idolatry. And when we do that, his radical uniqueness and transcendence becomes compromise. So obviously Muslims don't believe in things like divine incarnations, divine avatars, right? Uh, you know, sub subhanahu, uh, transcendent is God. Muslims don't believe in this type of thing. Like the Hindus believe divine avatars. Christians believe that Jesus is a divine incarnation. You know, I'm kind of a, a strange guy, uh, strange Muslim. I like to listen to Christian preaching a lot. So I'll be flipping through the channels <laughs> and I'll hear a preacher and I'll start watching. And there was this one time, my daughter, who's eight years old at the time, she's sitting at the dinner table doing her homework. And like a great father, I'm flipping channels, right? And I'm flipping the channels, and uh, there's this Christian preacher. He's an evangelical Christian preacher. And he was talking about how God came to the earth and so on and so forth. And I remember my daughter, she was doing her homework, and she looks over like this, and she says, God, earth, negative. <laughs> So, like in Hosea 11.9, Ki el anochi, I am God, velo ish, and not a man. Right? So, again, obviously then Muslims don't believe in, for example, uh, the, the doctrine of the Trinity, a belief in a triune God. The Quran addresses this directly. Wala taqulu thalatha, don't say Trinity. In tawkhayla lakum, is better for you. Innam Allahu ilahun wahid, for your God is an absolute unity. Muslims will actually say that this is, the Trinity is actually not the teaching of Jesus himself. This is part of our belief about Jesus, that Jesus did not teach this belief. So just a few dates to run by you um, for the note takers. 325 of the Common Era was the first ecum ecumenical church synod at Nicaea. And so this is the Greek episcopate at the time was basically split in half. There were followers of Athanasius, of Alexandria, and some followers of Arius of Alexandria. So Arius and his adherents said, Jesus is not equal to the Father. He's katisma teleon. He's the best of creation, but he's, he's caused by the Father. Therefore, he cannot be equal to the Father. Whereas Athanasius and his adherents said, no, Jesus shares an essence with God. That's the proto-Orthodox position. So they met at Nicaea in 325, and they voted on the issue. It's a very democratic process. They voted... And it came out to be that Jesus, yes, indeed, is equal with the Father. That happened in 325, the Common Era at Nicaea, modern-day Turkey, presided over by Constantine. A few years later, in 381, they met again at Constantinople, presided over by Theodosius, and they voted again, and the Holy Spirit was also given the title of God. Shares an essence with the Father and the Son. 421 at Ephesus. I mean, there are many, many councils, right? These are just a few of them. 421 Council of Ephesus. They voted that Mary is Theotokos, is the mother of God. 451, another vote, Chalcedon. Jesus has a dual nature. He's 100% God and 100% man. So classical Trinitarian theology wasn't defined until about this time, 4th and 5th century. Not until... Augustine of Hippo wrote De Trinitate, not until the Cappadocian church fathers dealt with Arianism and articulated the Trinity, not until the ratification of the Nicio Constantinopolitan Creed in 381 and so on and so forth. So Muslims don't believe that this is the teaching of Christ. Now, an interesting pericope in the synoptic tradition uh, is in Mark chapter 10, verse 18, and Luke 18, and Matthew 19, 17. So it's in three Gospels. It's, it's triply attested. It's called the synoptic tradition. So I'll quote from the one in Mark, because Mark, according to 
scholars is the more ancient of the Gospels, written around 70 of the Common Era. So Muslims will actually use this verse as a proof text, that a scribe comes to Jesus and he says, good master, didaskale agathe, right? And this is the Greek. Again, Jesus, we don't know what exactly Jesus, peace be upon him, said in his own language of Syriac, but this is what the, the Greek uh, manuscripts say. That this man came to him and said, good master. Jesus says, ti me leges agathon. And the construction here in Greek is very interesting. Ti me leges agathon. He brings the object, the maf'ul bihi, before the verb to emphasize the object. Why me or do you call good? As if to say, how dare you call me good? And then he says, Udes akathas e meheis hatheas. There's no one good but one, and that is God. So, another verse in the Torah, this is the sacred Shema, right? So, Deuteronomy 6 4, Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Here are Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, right? This is the sacred Shema, is Echad. Now, in Mark 12, 29, a scribe comes to Jesus and says, what is the greatest commandment, right? What is the greatest commandment? And Jesus actually will quote verbatim from the book of Deuteronomy. He quotes verbatim. The Quran says that Jesus said, that I have come to confirm the Mosaic laws with respect to theology. I confirm that theology. Right? So Jesus says to this scribe, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And then he continues, et Adonai. Uh, uh, he continues, and you shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, all thy soul, and all thy strength. Right? So Jesus confirms this message. Now, the Quran says, Qul hu Allahu Ahad. Right? This is something that our Imam, may Allah bless him, recited during the prayer just now. Uh, Allahu Ahad, say he is God, the Ahad, and Moses uses Ahad, and Jesus uses Ahad, and Muhammad uses Ahad. It's the same exact word. Allahu Samad, God is Samad, which is hard to translate. It basically means that God is an entity upon which every entity, every other entity is dependent upon, but he is totally independent of every other entity. Right? Lam Yalid wa Lam Yulad. He does not beget nor begotten, nor is he begotten, in the literal sense. وَلَمْ يَكُلْ لَهُ كُفُوًا أَحَد And there is nothing like unto God whatsoever. This is the meaning of Ahad. Now a common polemic against uh, Muslim theology, Islamic theology, is that the God of Islam is he's, he's impersonal, right? He's, he's too far removed. He's not imminent. You can't have a personal relationship with him. Right? We hear this a lot. Right? You can't have a personal relationship with Allah, right? this type of thing. So that's not our theology. I mean, that's what the Neoplatonists believe, that God is removed and there's emanation and intellection and all these types of things. And it was involuntary. And Muslims don't believe that. Uh, that's what the deists believe, like the founding fathers of this country. Most of them were deists, which basically is an offshoot of Neoplatonism which means that you know, God sort of was up there admiring himself, and then there was this involuntary emanation or spillage that created the rest of the world, but God doesn't really know what's going on in the world. He just knows uh, general ideas. He doesn't know particulars, and it's up to man to actually be like God on earth and to carry out things and so on and so forth. Muslims don't believe that at all. The Quran says, I, ver I, ver I quoted this verse earlier, وَنَحْنُ أَقْرَبُ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ حَبْلِ الْوَرِيدِ that we are closer to the human being than his jugular vein in reality, not in distance, not spatially, not in flesh and blood. Ultimately, it's a mystery. We, we can't comprehend it, but definitely not physically close to us. He's close, he's imminent in, a, in, in a, an essential type of way. The Quran says, وَإِذَا سَأَلَكَ عِبَادِ anni fa inni qareeb." When my servants ask you, O Muhammad, concerning me, say, I am Qareeb. Qareeb means very close. The Hebrew cognate of this is Qarev. Qarev in Hebrew means an internal organ. What's closer to you than an internal organ? That God is closer than your jugular vein, your life support, than your heart, than your lungs. That's how close is. He is imminent. He is close to us. The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he used to pray at least a third of the night even into his 60s, 
And it got to a point where his feet would be swollen red. And his wife, Umm al-Mu'minin, Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha, his wife Aisha, said, in meaning, O oh, Messenger of God, why do you do this? You know, you're the beloved of God. He said, Afala akunu abdan shakura. Shall I not be a grateful servant? In another transmission, shall I not be a grateful, loving servant? The title of the Prophet is Habibullah in our tradition. The beloved of God. That's his title. That's what we call him. The beloved of God. Definitely, without doubt, the God of Islam, who is the only God, the God of Abraham, uh, is close to us. We have a personal relationship with God because Muslims emulate the practices of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So he is transcendent, but he's also imminent, not physically, in his knowledge, in his mercy, and in his love. Now, get ready for a, another bomb, bombshell. Intellectual, not, not, not a real bomb. Don't, don't write something, don't misquote me on that. <laughs> that Muslims love Jesus, Moses, and Muhammad more than our own selves, more than our mothers, more than our children. And it's not just lip service. We love these people, real love. So love, this is, for some people this is a, a, a strange concept, that love is absolutely foundational in the Islamic tradition. Love. One of the names of God in the Quran is Al-Wadud, the all-loving. And the Prophet, peace be upon him, he used different similitudes and analogies to demonstrate divine love. One of the most powerful ones uh, is during one of the uh, military expeditions of the Prophet, uh, there was this woman that was running around uh, after one of the battles and she had lost her young son who was a toddler. And she's running around frantic and she's hysterical, my son, my son. And they're trying to find her son and she can't find her son. And finally she sees her son. And she picks him up, hugs him, and kisses him, and begins to breastfeed him. And the Prophet said to the companions that were there, can you imagine this woman throwing her son in a fire? Can you imagine that? He said, La wallahi, by God we can't. He said, Allahu arhamu bi ibadihi min hadihi bi waladiha. Allahu arhamu, Allah is more merciful to his servants than this woman is just now to her son. Right? So there, this type of analogy, this parental filial analogy, if it's, if, it's, uh, um, if it's allegorical, that's fine. But when we start talking about things that are literal, that's when the Muslim has to take a step back. Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, likened divine love to parental love. And what's also interesting is that two of the names of God in the Quran, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim. You see, before a Muslim decides to do anything worth doing, he or she will sanctify that action by pronouncing this sacred formula. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, the infinitely good, the most merciful. Right? So this word, these two names of God, Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, comes from Rahma, which means mercy. And this word comes from Raham, which means the womb of a mother. Right? Rahim in Hebrew. So there's a, there's a subtleness that cannot escape us here. We know that the purest type of love on earth is the love that a mother has for her child. But God is Ar-Rahman. He is infinitely more loving to his servants than this mother is to her child. There's a hadith, which is a, a prophetic uh, tradition of a Bedouin who came to the Prophet. And the Bedouin were kind of rough around the edges. right? So the Bedouin would come and he'd you know, grab the Prophet and call him by his first name and you know ask him all these questions and so on it's kind of rough around the edges so this Bedouin came to the prophet and he said ya muhammad mata sa'a said oh muhammad peace be upon him when is the hour of judgment when is the hour when is the day of judgment right and our teaching teaches us that no one knows the day or the hour right like when gabriel came to the prophet akhbirni an sa'a tell me about the hour the one being questioned knows no more than the questioner. The Quran says, They ask you about the hour. When will it be established? Say to them, This knowledge is only with my Lord. Right? Jesus says in three Gospels, Of that day knoweth no man, not the angels, not even the Son, but only the Father. 
So anyone who gives you a date, there's this guy in California, I don't know if you heard about this guy. In May 21st, I saw the billboard. It's going to happen. Oh, uh, October 21st. And then 1994, you know, William Miller, 18, whatever it was. Whoever gives you a date is a con man. Hold on to your wallets and purses. Okay? No one knows the hour. Jesus doesn't know the hour. Muhammad doesn't know the hour. Peace be upon him. Right? So this Bedouin says, Mata sa'a. When is the hour? Right? And the prophet, he asked him a question, a better question. What did you prepare for the hour? La shay'a. Nothing. Except his obligatory acts of worship. He prays five times a day and he gives his charity. He makes his pilgrimage. Very basic. Just the fara'id, the obligations. But then the Bedouin said, Illa anni uhibullah wa rasulah. But I love God and his messenger. And the Prophet said, Al mar'u ma'aman ahab. A person will be with those whom he loves. So this is very interesting because, again, there's a very common misunderstanding that Muslims believe that they can work their way towards heaven. Right? You do enough good deeds to offset the bad deed. 51, 49. You just made it. But if you're the other way, 51, 49, ah, you just missed it. Right? Muslims don't believe that. That's what a group of Muslims that are not orthodox called the Mu'tazila. That's what they believed. And there was a very small group and they're gone. But Sunni orthodoxy as well as Shia, they don't believe that. Muslims believe that salvation is given through grace, through mercy, through the love of God. Even the Prophet said, no one is justified by their works. This sound hadith, a sound tradition. And they said, Wala anta ya Rasulullah. Not even you? You've perfected ibadah and ubudiyah. You've perfected worship and servitude. Not even you? Wala ana illa an yatagammadani Allah bi rahma. Except that my Lord envelops me in his mercy. Mercy is the thing that saves. Mercy. So this idea that you know, because the Quran talks about scales and things like that. People are very literalists get the wrong idea. The Mu'tazilite believe that. You can do some research on that. The Mu'tazilite were highly influenced by Aristotelian philosophy and Neoplatonism and so on and so forth. But Muslims believe it's through grace, through love of God. So the Quran says, Whoever is averted from punishment on the day of judgment is only from the mercy of God. Let's go back to the concept of love. The Prophet said in a sound hadith, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام. He said, none of you uh, believe, none of you truly believe until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. And a great hadith scholar, Imam Nawawi, he says that in this hadith, the word for brother, which is akh, which is for in Hebrew and in Arabic, it doesn't simply mean your Muslim brother. It means your brother or sister because the male gender encapsulates the female gender in the Semitic languages. Your brother or sister in the children of Adam and Bani Adam. If we go back far enough, we're all brothers and sisters. That's his interpretation and that's the normative interpretation of the verse. None of you truly believe until he loves or she loves for his, her, for his brother or sister in the children of Adam what he loves for himself. The religion of Islam is a universal religion. It's a cosmopolitan faith. The Prophet is a universal messenger. The Quran says, this is kind of like our equivalent to John 3.16. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكِ إِلَّا رَحْمَةِ لِلْعَالَمِينَ Surah 21, Ayah 107. 21, 107. We did not send you, O Muhammad, except as a mercy unto all the worlds. One out of four human beings on earth is Muslim. People don't really realize this, yeah? So, you know, it's, it says in the pamphlet here, there are 30 million Muslims in China. There are actually 200 million Muslims in Indonesia. 200 million Muslims. Not a single Muslim soldier ever stepped foot on the, so on the soil of Indonesia. How do you get 200 million Muslims? Because if you, again, you listen to the, the warmongering, the profligates, Islam is gonna take over the world, they conquer by the sword, study history. Indonesia, 200 million Muslims. If the Arab world doesn't even equal 200 million people, right? But in Indonesia, there's 200 million Muslims. The majority of Albania, these are people with blue eyes and blonde hair. The majority religion is Islam. 20,000 Americans every year become Muslim. I'm sure many of you, your cousin, your brother, your coworker, 
And that's what, we're, that's what we're saying is, actually sit down and speak with these people. If you see a Muslim, ask them questions, right? Don't go turn on the boob tube, right? And listen to some, we won't name drop Bill O'Reilly. <laughs> and listen to these guys, Pat Robertson. We're not going to name drop or anything. And, you know, oh, wow, Muslims, oh, my God, but, he, but Abdul at work seems so nice. I can't believe it. Wow, he's really out to get me, huh? This type of thing. One out of four human beings is Muslim, right? So we have to realize. So, but with that said, Islam is not a monolith, okay? So this is another common misconception. Indeed, there is a great cohesiveness with respect to our theology. Muslims are very much united theologically. But when it comes to cultural things, to methodology, to uh, politics, uh, the religion is very, very, very vast. It's not a monolith. I was in a church a few months ago, and I was talking about love and Islam like I'm doing now. And an older gentleman, he stood up, Caucasian gentleman. Uh, it, was, it was in a Lutheran church. And he said, uh, how do you explain sectarian violence in some city in South Pakistan? The Sunnis and Shias are killing each other. How do you explain it? Right? I was, oh, put me on the spot. So I asked him, I said, why, why would you even think I'm in a position to answer that question? I don't even know what Muslims are doing in the next town over. I don't even know why my wife is mad at me half the time. How am I supposed to answer what Muslims in South Pakistan are doing? I mean, seriously. He said, well, aren't you Muslim? You know, it's, it's, like, the, it's like that comedian Maz Jabrani. He's an Iranian comic. Have you heard of Maz Jabrani? It's this funny joke, because he's, he's from Iran, and he's at work one day, and he's sitting in his cubicle, and he says that some of the non-Muslims that work with him, they come to him and say, so Maz, what's going on with the gas prices? <laughs> so, I don't know. Oh, aren't you Iranian? It's like, it's like there's some worldwide, it's not a monolith. I have no idea what's going on, right? <laughs> Muslims are vast, right? So I asked this gentleman, I said, um, how do you explain Catholics and Protestants killing each other in the streets of Belfast, Ireland a few years ago. He's all, he, said, he said, I'm not Irish. Okay, there you go. <laughs> and I don't think it clicked with him immediately, but I don't expect him to know. So Christianity is very vast. Islam is very vast. There's a group of Christians, and unfortunately they have a lot of influence in America that believe it is, in fact, their duty to tame the Ishmaelite. Right? That they're about empire building, they have imperialistic aspirations. I encourage you to read a book by an American Christian, Chris Hedges, called American Fascism, which he talks about these, these elements within Christianity. It's by a Christian man, Chris Hedges, Harvard Theological Seminary, because Christians, Jews, and Muslims believe that God has a preferential aspect, right? That God is not with those who are dropping bombs on innocent civilians. God is not with the one who is exer exerting a strong hand. God is with the downtrodden. God is with the poor. God is with the subaltern. God is with the one who's been rejected by the society. There's a preferential aspect according to all three religions. Right? Like when Jesus is in the synagogue, in Luke chapter 4, when he announces his messiahship, he reads from the scroll of Isaiah. What does he say? He says, the spirit of God, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. In order, to anoint, in, order to anoint, uh, uh, in order to anoint the poor, heal the brokenhearted, free the oppressed, right? Social justice. The prophets were social reformers, right? <clears throat> so my point here is that every religion is vast. And if you have one out of four on earth that are Muslim, invariably you're going to have a few nut jobs. It's one out of four human beings. There's like two billion people, right? <clears throat> Another hadith of the Prophet, he says, uh, Very beautiful hadith. None of you will enter paradise until you truly believe. And none of you truly believe until you love one another. Shall I tell you of something that will increase your love? They said, yes. Spread peace amongst yourselves. Spread peace amongst yourselves. Uh, I got invited a few months ago to, to an interfaith uh, talk at a church, and there was like 15 speakers. So I, I was given five minutes. I'm thinking, what can I say in five minutes? Right? I just quoted this one statement of the prophet. And the organizer of this event was a, was a young woman. She was a PhD student at a Christian seminary. And 
right after the event, she, she was crying and her arms were open. She's running towards me to give me a hug. She said, I had no idea that you guys even believed in love. I mean, this is almost a PhD in theology, mind you. Forget it. God bless the, if such are the pastors, then God bless the congregation, as they say, right? So she's running and she's, give me a hug. And of course, I can't touch her because there's, you know, so I'm trying to slip my way out and I'm trying to find a sister. I'm trying to give her a detour, right? So it's, this is very interesting because our Orthodox Jews, they don't touch either, right? It's called Shomer Nagaya the guard against the touch. Like, if this is why I wanted to, before I shook anyone, tried to shake anyone's hand, I wanted to give this talk, that if I don't shake your hand, it's because I respect you. I can only touch, like, my wife, my mother, my daughter, right? That's part of our tradition. Uh, so I was, this is something that is really, it's, it's been a puzzle for me for many, many years because it's always almost offensive to people. So I asked one of my teachers, he's a rabbi, Rabbi Mendel, I said, how do you deal with the Shomer Nagaya? What do you say to the woman who puts her hand out and then you have to tell her, I can't shake your hand and she's embarrassed, she's offended. So he gave me advice. He said, he said, do this. Put your hand over your heart and say, I salute you from my heart. I said, wow, that's good. So, so the first opportunity I got, this girl put her hand out to me and I went like this and I said, I salute you from my heart. And she kind of giggled and I was like, yes. So then I went home and I told my wife, I said, look, this is what happened. I did that. She giggled. She said, why are you flirting with her? <laughs> so concerning, I'm running out of time. I want to save some time for questions. I'll probably take another five minutes, inshallah. Concerning Jesus, peace be upon him, what does the Quran say? The Quran says that he is a prophet of God, legitimate prophet, messenger. He's the Messiah. What does it mean for him to be the Messiah, the Messiah? We can talk about that. The Quran says that he performed miracles by the permission of God, that he's the word of God. Kalimatullah, is that the same as the Logos? Like it says in John 1, 1, NRK, Halagos. Is it the same thing? I would say, no, it's not the same thing. What is the difference? That's a dissertation in and of itself. Uh, so this is what Muslims believe, right? The Jewish view of Jesus is vast, but generally, I won't quote from the Talmud, generally it's unfavorable. But probably the most congenial opinion you'll get is that he was a very great rabbi, but certainly not a prophet, nor the Messiah, certainly not God. Muslims say that he's a prophet, he's a Messiah, he's a messenger of God, he's a blessed man. Like the verse I quoted earlier, that Jesus is quoted to have said, and he has made me blessed wherever I am. Now, interestingly, this is another major difference of opinion, and it's going to be kind of a shock, I think, for people to hear, but Muslims don't believe that Jesus was crucified, right? Muslims don't believe that. Mus the Quran categorically rejects the crucifixion, and we can also talk about that, but what's also, what's interesting about this is, remember I was talking about the names of prophets? There are certain mysteries in the names of prophets, right? So Jesus' name, according to Aramaic sources was Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, Yeshua Bar Maryam, right? And it's interesting because this word Yeshua is from a triliteral root word, like all Semitic words, Yasha, to save or to deliver. However, the scale of this name is passive. It's a passive participle, not active, not save your, but saved. Passive. Yeshua means the one who is saved by God. The Quran says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا سَلَبُوهُ وَلَكِنْ شُبِّهَ لَهُمْ I know it's kind of hard to hear sometimes. That he was not killed nor crucified, but it was made to appear so unto his enemies that he was. وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ يَقِينًا For a surety they killed him not. And just as Christians will use certain places in the Hebrew Bible, like Psalm 22, Isaiah chapter 53, the suffering servant, as proof text that Jesus was crucified, the Muslims will say that this idea that Jesus wasn't crucified is actually more in line with pre-Christian messianic Jewish expectations. Like David writes in the Psalms, it's very explicit. Psalm 20, verse 6. He says in his own language, in the Hebrew language, he says, I know that God, the, the Lord, saves his Messiah. 
is the active participle for the Lord. Saves who? Mashiach, his Messiah, that God saves, his Messiah. And in 1945, they discovered, because for, for the longest time, for 1,300 years, the only scripture that made this claim was the Quran. The only religious tradition that made this claim that Jesus wasn't crucified were the Muslims. But in 1945, at Nag Hammadi in Egypt, they discovered Christian treatises and gospels and apocalypses like the second treatise of the great Seth, the Coptic apocalypse of Peter, the Acts of John was later discovered, that actually state that there were indeed Christian denominations before the advent of the Prophet Muhammad that denied the crucifixion. This predates Islam. This actually predates the formation of the New Testament canon. Right? And Ignatius of Antioch, uh, his letter to the Trallians, he also mentions that there are Christians who deny the crucifixion. So this was, this was my, uh, my master's thesis, was on topics like this, uh, in particular, the book of Galatians in the New Testament. So, uh, you know, Paul wrote the book of Galatians, and he accuses the Galatians of believing in uh, heteron evangelion, another gospel, right? And according to Christian exegetes, like F.C. Bauer, which is the standard opinion when it comes to Galatians, uh, Paul's enemies that he's denouncing are actually missionaries sent from James, from Jerusalem, these are disciples of Jesus that are being sent into Jerusalem to correct what they consider to be Paul's deviant teachings. So Paul unleashes on them. He calls them false apostles, super apostles, sarcastically. He calls them dogs, enemies of the cross, right? Things, things of this nature. He's vehemently opposed to them. I mean, there's, there's a fundamental difference of opinion between uh, these missionaries from James who are Syriac-speaking Nazarene Christians. We would say that there were Muslims who believed that Jesus was the Messiah, that you follow the sacred law, and that they believed in our theology, which is Tawheed, the absolute transcendence of God. What's also interesting is that James, the letter of James, which was not liked by Martin Luther for obvious reasons, he called it a letter of straw. He actually proposed that we remove it from the canon. Right? Um, James, who is a successor of Jesus, according to history, the book of Acts, uh, he has one book out of 27 in the New Testament, whereas Paul has 14, more than half of the New Testament, right? James's name in Hebrew is Yaakov HaTzaddiq. Yaakov HaTzaddiq, which is very interesting because the successor, the name of the successor of the Prophet Muhammad was also HaTzaddiq, Abu Bakr As-Siddiq, right? The truthful one, the, the trustworthy one, right? So it's interesting because after the vote at Nicaea in 325, history tells us by 360, 360, which is a few years after Nicaea, the majority of the bishops in the empire, they believed in Ebionite theology. They believed that Jesus was not God, that he was a created entity. Then Paul talks about in Galatians, the Ishmaelites, and he denigrates the Ishmaelites. He denigrates Hagar, the mother of Ishmael, you know, this type of propaganda. He denigrates them. And then he says that I came from Arabia. This is what Paul says. This is very interesting. Why is he saying that? Why is he talking about the Ishmaelites? Why is he talking about Arabia? I'll be done in one minute, inshallah. My contention is that these missionaries from James, they told the Galatians that the final messenger of God would come from Arabia and that he would be an Ishmaelite. And the Quran quotes Jesus as saying, وَإِذْ قَالَ عِيسَى بْنُ مَرْيَمْ يَا بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلِ إِنِّي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ إِلَيْكُمْ مُصَدِّقَ لِمَا بَيْنَ يَدَيَّ مِنَ التَّوْرَةِ وَمُبَشِّرًا بِرَسُولِي يَأْدِي مِنْ بَعْدِ إِسْمُهُ أَحْمَدِ Jesus says, O children of Israel, I am the messenger of God sent to you, confirming the Torah which came before me, and to give you glad tidings of a messenger to come after me, whose name is Ahmad, which is the superlative form of the name Muhammad. Um, so they're, they're giving me the, the, the stop sign here. So uh, I'm, at this point, I have a few more things I wanted to say. There's some prophecies in the Bible that I wanted to quote that I believe refer to the Prophet, peace be upon him. But maybe next time when I come, inshallah ta'ala, I'll have to ask Dr. Zaki if I'm welcomed back. Um, I hope no one was offended. It's, it's very important that we have this kind of Socratic speech. This is America. This is not some fascist country, right? This is America. We have freedom of speech. We should be, we should be able to listen 
and disagree and to have a discourse. Right? So I thank you for your lack of outbursts and your, your lack of throwing food at me. And I hope, I hope I just gave you something to think about a little bit. We have to keep thinking. Right? We can't live in a bubble. I mean, we have to sort of broaden our horizons. There's a whole other world out there. Right? We have to keep learning. Complacency is something that is a terrible thing. Don't be satisfied with yourself. Keep striving to learn, to broaden your mind, to, to learn a different culture, whatever it is. Uh, so that was the point of my talk. Uh, I hope it was beneficial for you. Uh, and I'd like to entertain any comments or questions that you may have. We have, we have five minutes for the question and answer. Hello. Testing. Anybody has a question? That means they all agree. <laughs> And they understood everything I said. I did a great job. Please ask question. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for a very lovely talk. Um, I'm here from the Jewish community. And um, I appreciate it very much. Uh, you're pointing out so many of the similarities. And of course, between Hebrew and Aramaic and Arabic, uh, we share much in terms of language as well. I'm wondering if you can address a little bit some, and, and I understand that the Quran, like the Jewish texts, are very wide and have very wide ranging views on a lot of things. But can you talk a little bit about um, the existence in the Quran of the idea of the dimi? of the status that is, uh, is given to Jews and Christians in Muslim society. Yes. So it's a very good question. I direct you to... alaikum. This is not a question. This is just that uh, looking into uh, King James Bible, mm -hmm. uh, James chapter 4, verse 7, when I go and speak in churches, I says, but this is telling you to submit. It says, submit yourself, therefore, to God and reject the devil. So when we say Islam, we say submission. And that's what Muslims do. Just submit yourself. He's created us all. And he does not need anything from us more than for us to obey him, respect him and submit ourselves. And here Jesus, peace be upon him, saying, submit yourself, therefore, to God, and reject the devil. And this is, if you want to remember, James chapter 4, verse 7. I do, when I speak in churches, I bring that out, and many people, because you read the Bible, you'll see that submission is the word. He needs to have something. Okay, so let, let me um, answer the, the sister's question before we take any more questions, please. She asked about the status of a dhimmi, uh, which is a, non, a protected non-Muslim living in a Muslim country. So the Quran uh, um, addresses in its sacred law uh, different types of faith-based communities. Uh, the Quran allows for religious pluralism. If you study the history again, I mean, if you look at the world today, you have a bunch of post-colonial puppets, and it's, it's, <laughs> it's really easy to get confused. Uh, but if you study history, Muslim Spain, Al-Andalusia, the golden age of Judaism, where Islamic Sharia and Christian common law and Jewish halaqa law were all practiced freely, as long as it did not uh, contradict the laws of the empire, it's fine. Uh, you look at some place like... Um, uh, um, uh, uh, the, the, the city of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in Medina. There were several Jewish tribes living in Medina, and his first order of business was to uh, construct or formulate the Medinan constitution, right? Which stipulates very clearly, because again, you'll hear from the profligate, the Muslim hater, the bigot, that the Prophet, he, he didn't like the Jews, and he killed all the Jews, he exiled the Jews. His first, his first order of business 
in the Medinan constitution, he says the Jews shall have access to their temples and they shall worship God without being molested or harmed in any way. That's what he says in the actual document. So there's a verse in the Quran, Surah Al-Hajj, ayah number, so chapter 22, verse 38. In which it says, uh, 39. Permission is given to those, permission has been given to those to fight against whom war is made. So there's always a defensive aspect. This is in the passive voice, right? Because you'll hear different translators that are Orientalist say that this is an active voice, that go fight people, right? This is in the passive voice. That if you're being fought, you have the permission to defend yourself. And this is what Thomas Aquinas said. This is the just war theory of Augustine of Hippo. This is nothing new to uh, you know, Maimonides, to Jewish Judeo-Christian tradition. And then he says, they are those who have been expelled from their homes in defiance of right, for no other reason that they said our Lord is God. Did not God check one set of people by means of another? They would surely have been pulled down and destroyed. Monasteries, churches, synagogues, and mosques in which the name of God is commemorated. This is the most ecumenical verse I've ever come across. So a dhimmi, a non-Muslim living in a Muslim land is protected by the Muslim polity. That's how it's supposed to be. I don't know what's going on in the world today. It's a big mess. Don't even, you know, like that man who asked me about South Pakistan. I don't know. I know how what the Sharia says, what the sacred law says. That a non-Muslim is protected uh, in a Muslim country to the point where if a group of Muslims in that country decide to attack that Christian or Jewish community, it is upon the Muslim government to attack those Muslims who are trying to attack the Jewish and Christian community. Right? This, this is according to our sacred law. This is what our law says. The Prophet, peace be upon him, says, مَنْ قَتَلَ مُعَاهِدًا مَنْ قَتَلَ مُعَاهِدًا لَمْ يُرِحْ رَائِحَةَ الْجَنَّةِ أو كَمَا قَالَ The Prophet says, whoever kills a dhimmi, a non-Muslim living in a Muslim country, or a dhimmi can also mean a non-Muslim living in a non-Muslim country between which there is a peace treaty. Whoever kills that dhimmi won't even get the whiff of paradise. Won't even get a scent or smell of paradise. Right? So even people like Norman Geisler, who wrote this book called Answering Islam. Now it's a big website. And in 1993, he wrote a book called Answering Islam. He actually says that, because he's addressing this issue of spread by the sword, right? That... He said, if you look in North Africa, right, he says, if you look in North Africa, he said, the majority of people in North Africa became Muslim willingly because of Islam's low taxes and its stress on brotherhood. That's what, he's, that's what Norman Geisler says. He says, this sword thing is a myth. Obviously, it's happened from time to time. One out of four human beings on earth, again, you're going to have a nut job. It's just you're going to have a nut job every so often. That's how it is. Right? But that's not what the religion teaches. So he actually says that in his book, Answering Islam. He says, because of the low taxes, because the Byzantium Empire were charging their Christian subjects something unbelievable when it came to taxes. But that's what Norman Geisler says. I mean, he's not willing to entertain that these people actually believed in Islam. No, 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 that can't be the, that can't be the reason why. There must be some <laughs> monetary incentive of some, of some sort. Right? Uh, but that's, that's what it is in a nutshell. Obviously, this is a, a major topic, right? But the Quran is an ecumenical scripture. It recognizes uh, uh, the rights of non-Muslims living in, living in a Muslim country um, uh, and, uh, and codifies those, those rights. And the thing about Sharia, what I want to mention, because we heard the word, you know, Sharia law. They want to implement Sharia, right? Sharia. Right? We hear that all the time. The fear-mongering, right? Sharia linguistically means a path towards cold water. Right? Every Muslim follows Sharia. It's an indispensable part of the Muslim identity. What is Sharia? Th that's the point. We have to define our own terminology. When we let others define our terminology and speak our narrative, that's very dangerous. Edward Said says that's the most powerful form of imperialism is when you, when you define the other, right? Because if you say, if your definition of Sharia is a draconian law code, a draconian penal system, then if that's accepted, then there cannot be a single Muslim in America. If that's accepted, there cannot be a single Muslim in America. 
And that's not America. That's something else. Right? Because when a Muslim prays, he's following Sharia. When a Muslim smiles at someone, he's following Sharia. When a Muslim goes to the mosque, when he gives charity, all, everything. It's an indispensable aspect of a Muslim's identity. Right? So, it's very important for Muslims to speak their own uh, narrative. Right? I hope I've uh, answered the question. I mean, if you look at the Muslim world historically, there's churches in, in Egypt that claim to have, the Christians in Egypt claim that their church was founded by Mark, the evangelist, when Islam came to Egypt, it did not do away with the church. There are 20 million Coptic Christians. If Islam has no regard for non-Muslims and believes in the indiscriminate killing, perpetual state of warfare, which less than 1% of 1% of scholars have ever endorsed in our tradition, then these churches would not be standing. The Assyrian church in Iraq, founded by Thaddeus, a disciple of Jesus, according to those Christians, almost every single Muslim country you'll find a, every single Muslim country, you'll find a church except for Saudi Arabia. But here's my contention with that. Will you find a Protestant church in the Vatican? Will you find a mosque in the, in the Vatican? No, because that's considered sacred land and so on and so forth. And so we have to sort of put things in perspective. I'm getting the sign again. <laughs> He's directing me like I'm a, a Boeing. So, inshallah, can we just take one, I only answered one question. Can we take one, one more question, if there's a, a pressing issue? Yes, um, um, what's that? Oh, okay. That's a good question. So, uh, there, there's a comment about me um, speaking of, about the creation of Adam with respect to Jesus, or comparing the creation. Um, so, uh, the Quran says, "Inna mathal Isa inna Allahi kamathal Adam." The similitude of Jesus with God is like that of Adam. Khalaqahu min turab. We created him; he created him from dust. Thumma qala lahu kun fayakun, and then he said to him, "Be," and there he was. Right. So, this idea that Jesus is the literal or begotten Son of God. Muslims do not accept, right? Um, I mean, uh, I guess someone has to sort of explain to me what that means. Because you'll hear this a lot from Christians, that Jesus is the Son of God by virtue of the virgin birth. So the Muslims, they, they're hesitant to comment about that. Um, the, the Muslims will say that the creation of Jesus was a miracle, that Jesus is a prophet, and it was one of the signs, it's from the mu'jizat, from the miracles that God gave to Jesus. Uh, a sign that he's a prophet of God. And the Quran makes mention of Adam in the same vein, that Adam didn't have a mother or a father. Right? Isn't that greater? But it's all the same to God. Creation is easy for God. God can create fire out of... He can make ice burn. He can make fire cold. He can do anything. Right? That's conceivable. According to, uh, then we get into a theological discussion again. Can he her, warm up a burrito that's too hard, hot, for him, hot for him to eat and so on and so forth? We won't get into that issue, right? Um, but the virgin birth of Jesus is seen as just a sign that he was sent from God. Not that he's the literal or begotten son of God. Because in the Old Testament, Israel is my son, even the firstborn, right? Uh, uh, David, this day I have begotten you. In the New Testament, Adam, Luke, in the genealogy, says Adam is the son of God, right? In 1 John, it says, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is the son of God. Paul says in Romans chapter 8 that whoever is led by the Spirit of God is the son of God. This is obviously metaphorical, right? That means they're beloved of God. That's what that means. And the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used the same analogy to show the love of God. But when we start talking about Jesus as the literal son of God, begotten, not made, this type of language, Right, that's when the Muslims say, Lam yalid wa lam yulad. No, we don't speak about God like that. The similitude of Jesus is like that of Adam. God created everything from dust, from human humanity from dust, and then he said to him, be, and there he was. So it's just another miracle. We're out of time. Assalamu alaikum.